Thanks, Dan, and thanks for the tip about donor tech. I hope everybody took that down. I certainly did. I didn't know about that. Um, yes, I'm a program manager with the Maya Foundation and Sydney Maya Fund, and I'd like to start off with a question, a different question. Has anyone ever been to a Maya store? <laughs> Meyer stores were, started, were established by a man called Sidney Meyer, who 75 years ago, last week, on the 5th of September, died, and with his will left 10% of his fortune for charitable purposes for the benefit of the community in which he made his fortune. We interpret that very broadly to mean the whole of Australia, um, and those crucial words, charitable purposes, which were mentioned before, though they're very important. Um, and I'll come back to that. The Maya Foundation was established 50 years ago this year, so it's a big year for us, and you may see a couple of booklets out there that are about our commemorative grants program. Um, the Maya Foundation was established by two of Sidney Maya's sons, the late Kenneth Maya and Bailey Maya. Both of those organisations, we operate together, we can fund um, organisations that may or may not have DGR or charitable tax concession status, as long as the purpose is charitable. And I think that's important and we fund Australia-wide. However, if you do have those things, please supply the documentation because it's a helpful shorthand for us. We make grants across a number of programs. Um, a few years ago we moved to a large grants, small grants model and I'm going to focus on some of the small grants programs today. I'll talk mainly about three programs, Poverty and Disadvantage, Education and G4. If you're an arts organisation, um, I can talk to you about that, but I'll perhaps do that um, afterwards in refreshments. The education program can make grants to schools, mainly government but not exclusively government schools. There are some Catholic schools that have received funding as well and small community-based organisations. Uh, in this program, the projects should be aiming to achieve educational outcomes for young people naught to 25 years of age, so early childhood to 25 years. They should be small, discrete projects, so not a small part of a $150,000 project. There are a couple of priority areas within that, projects that encourage integration and improve educational outcomes for students from culturally and, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and rural and regional communities as well. In this program we can make grants up to $10,000 for projects with total budgets of up to $50,000 also. There's a bit of flexibility around that. So we encourage you to have other funders as well. We don't want to be exclusive and recognise that projects will often take more than $10,000. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of projects funded recently. Um, outside there was a pile of annual reports and this lists every grant made in the financial year and it's a really good way of looking at the kinds of things that we've supported across all the programs. But just a couple. <coughs> we've supported the a fantastic project, which I absolutely love, and the photos are fantastic, and if only I could show you, called Cycling Scientists, um, a project by two people who were auspiced, more or less, by the Canberra Environment and Sustainability Resource Centre. They cycled around Cape York Peninsula, taking science education to remote schools. They cycled thousands of kilometres, up hills and down dales, carrying trailers of material, they mailed materials ahead to them to the schools and they did science education in, in five student schools and in remote communities. It was just fantastic. In New South Wales, the Bowerville Central School, Central School had a project called My Language, My Country, which linked Bowerville and Wilcannia in a schools exchange program with, for their Indigenous students. And that had the aim of improving literacy and numeracy for Indigenous students and it was specifically about cultural identity, uh, language maintenance and so on. Operation Stitches is not a school, it's a small community based organisation and we supported an out of school homework club for that organisation for primary school students from a high rise housing estate. So that was about meeting the needs of a particular um, disadvantaged group within the community. 
Poverty and Disadvantage is a similar program. It's one that I manage. Um, it has some specific guidelines and of course for all of these programs that I'm talking about all the details are on the website. Um, I think that for this program, program you could actually drive a truck through these guidelines if you look at what we've actually funded. The current uh, the program aims to support projects that alleviate the negative effects of poverty and disadvantage with a current focus on um, Indigenous Australians, asylum seekers and refugees and people living in isolated rural and remote areas of Australia and also children and young people from impoverished backgrounds. Within that we support a huge range of things and things outside of those priorities as well. Again they're grants for up to $10,000 with total budgets of up to about fifty. So a couple of examples of those funded recently are in Western Australia, the David Wirupanda Foundation runs the Dare to Dream program. We supported that program in Yule Brook and it's a mentoring program for adolescent Indigenous girls mainly which is aiming to build confidence and essentially keep them in school. Um, there are lots of programs using sport and football in, t in particular that focus on Indigenous boys and they re work really well. Um, this one's about girls who sometimes I think get a bit forgotten in the mix. Cardinia Casey Community Health Service ran a women's water exercise group and this was a therapeutic water exercise program for Afghan women in the Casey Dandenong area of Melbourne. The, again in Casey area, Casey North Community Information Service produced a low income guide. We supported that. So it's a guide for low income residents on budgeting, um, recipes, cheap recipes, access to services and so on. And again Cranbourne, oh, that's on this side of town too, Cranbourne Christian Fellowship Centre has developed a community garden and we've supported that. So there's a whole range of things. The annual report will give you an idea of the breadth of things that we've covered through those programs. Now those two programs have uh, no closing dates. We, you can submit an application any time and we have six rounds per year for, those, for each of those programs. So if you've just missed one, you, your application will be assessed in the next round. No closing dates there. G4. G4 is a very, in some ways, a very non-descriptive um, program name. It tells you nothing about what it's about, apart from that it's the fourth generation of the Maya family. All of our committees and governance structures are made up of Maya family members, children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Sydney Maya and Dame Merlin Maya, his wife. G4 is the fourth generation, which has members from naught to 35. So once fourth generation members turn 18, they can join this committee. They can also sit on other committees as well. This program focuses on youth, essentially. Covers, will fund activities that are about capacity building for youth organisations, environmental education, targeting and involving young people 12 to 25 years, youth driven events and activities and initiatives addressing the health of young people. Now all of this is also on the website, I assure you. This, makes, this program we can make grants up to $5,000 for projects with total budgets up to 30. Now this program has four rounds per year and so it does have closing dates. There's a closing date coming up at the end of October, 27th of October is there is a closing date for the next G4 round. So if you're interested in that I urge you to get onto the website and have a look and think about whether that's appropriate for you. Um, some examples of things funded through that program include Sports Health Check Australia, Disengaged Youth Health Program. This was a project working with young people in the Melbourne Juvenile Justice Centre, providing them with an opportunity to gain cert, uh, certificate level one and two in personal health, fitness and nutrition. The Ocean Grove Neighbourhood Centre Drop-In Program, which is a youth development program for 12 to 17-year-olds. Again, a wide range of things covered there. There are some things we don't fund. Of course, there's always bad news. And if you look at our website, you'll see a long list of things we don't fund. So I'll just mention a couple of them. Political parties or their candidates. Individuals without a funding partner. This is most um, 
relevant to the arts program where individual artists apply and they do so through a funding partner organisation. And organisations that have not acquitted previous projects funded through the foundation or the fund. So if you've had a grant previously, we can't look at the next application until you've told us about the previous application. So it's a good idea to do it. And just on that note, it's also really important for us to get reports on projects so that we can see how those programs are going. Are we hitting the mark in the way that we want to in the education program or the poverty and disadvantage program? And so individual project reports are really important in that. We don't make grants for personal living or education <coughs> expenses or commercial activities or public appeals and fundraising strategies. So if it's a general fundraising campaign, we can't support that. The education program doesn't support international travel for students either. We'll do school trips to Canberra, but we won't do the school trip to Beijing. <laughs> How to apply? Well, go to the website. Application forms are there. You need to email it and send us it in hard copy. Um, very quickly, my tip for a, a good application is tell me what the project is about, what is the issue, and then tell me who, what, when, how often, how many, and that's it, essentially. I really should tell you that all of these programs are competitive. Um, I do want to receive applications from Gippsland. Looking at the last three years, we've made two grants in Gippsland area and we've only received two applications. Um, having said that, the success rates range from 10% in arts and humanities to 50, 40 to 50% in other programs. So it is competitive. You can meet guidelines and still not be successful, unfortunately, but you've got to be in it to win it. And if you don't apply to us, then we don't know who you are. So I urge you to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today and we can talk more outside or the questions later. And now I get to introduce Austin Patterson, lucky last, from the RE Ross Trust.